Hi everyone, welcome back to the YouTube session and I'm Dr. Preeti Sharma and I'll be taking the microbiology crash course for the upcoming exams that is NEET as well as FMG. Now, well, if you're new here, then we've already conducted three sessions prior. We've had two sessions on general microbiology, one extensive session on mycology that is fungus. And today we'll be starting off with bacteriology, all the important bacteria, the important topics, points, MCQs and images that you need to know for particular bacteria and specially important for the upcoming exams. So yes, let's begin with bacteriology. And before I begin, I just want to tell everyone uh, that all these crash courses that I'm conducting or the classes that I'm taking on the YouTube channel, the PDF of these is also available. You can download them from the Telegram group. Either you are part of the Telegram group or channel or both, uh, you can definitely download it from either. And uh, the name of the channel is uh, put up in the description below. You can follow that. It's Pathology by Dr. Preeti Sharma. You can click on the link, you can follow it and you can download all the PDFs that are being taught out here. Well, let's begin with the session. So these are the set of bacteria that we have to start with. We are going to talk about cocci and we are going to talk about bacilli. So first, First, I'll talk about a general rule. Now, the general rule says that all the cocci are going to be gram positive. All the cocci, they tend to be gram positive, whereas all the bacilli, they tend to be gram negative. So first, I'm starting, I'm not going into these mnemonics right now. First, I'm starting with all of these, uh, you know, the very first category and that is referred to as the cocci. So when I say cocci, remember, the cocci are gram positive except Neisseria, Moraxella and Velonella. Except for these three, we have all the others are gram positive. Repeating, all are gram positive except Neisseria, Moraxella, Velonella. These are the only cocci, these are the only cocci which are going to be gram negative. So first, let me begin uh, before I go on to the bacilli. I'm only going to stick to the cocci as of now. And I'll make you attempt a question first and then we'll start with the discussion. The synergohymenotrophic toxin of Staph aureus happens to be PV, alpha hemolysin, beta hemolysin, gamma hemolysin, whatever options you feel you have to mark from here. So some of you know about this, some of you don't. So what I'll do, I'll teach you first and I'll get back to this question. We basically have to talk about all the different types of uh, toxins that are there in Staphylococcus aureus. So first let's see, we have a lot of virulence factors. Why does Staphylococcus aureus cause all of its features that we are talking about? Number one, it has something called protein A. Where is protein A present? That's a question. Protein A is present in the cell wall of Staphylococcus. Aureus. Repeating, protein A is present in the cell wall of Staphylococcus aureus. What does protein A do? Everything with A. It is going to have an antiphagocytic property, means when Staphylococcus will enter our body, we will try to eat it up, we will try to phagocytose it. Protein A will protect it, it will make it antiphagocytic. Similarly, it is another anti thing, anti complementary. It is also anti complementary and it also helps in a test known as the coagglutination test. Please remember protein A has three uses, antiphagocytic, anti-complementary and it is used in the coagglutination test. So that is the use of protein A which is present in the cell wall of the bacteria. Other than that, there are toxins. What toxins are there? Which break the blood? Hemolysins, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Repeating, hemolysins will break the blood, alpha, beta, gamma and delta hemolysins are present. There's something known as the PV toxin. If you want to know the full form, PV stands for Pantin Valentin toxin. Even if you learn it as Pantin Valentin, you learn it as PV, it's good enough. Please remember the way you write PV. And out of this alpha, beta, gamma, remember the way you write gamma, gamma looks very much like a V, right? So remember the PV toxin and the gamma hemolysin are together working, they are said to be a unit, synergy, they, they are said to be a unit. So they are together known as the synergohymenotropic toxin of Staph aureus. Repeating what all? We said the Pantin Valentin toxin and the way you write V is the way you write gamma. So the Pantin Valentin toxin and the gamma hemolysin means the correct answer over here was option number D that these two together are known as the synergohymenotropic toxin. 
let's move forward there's something known as the exfoliative toxin or epidermolytic toxin what does this word tell me epidermo means some skin problem it will cause exfoliation it will cause exfoliation of the skin everyone has heard of uh, staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome sss there is something known as staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome and that is caused by this toxin similarly toxic epidermolytic necrosis or 10 10 all these epidermolytic kind of disorders or exfoliation of the skin kind of disorders like sss and 10 they are caused by staph aureus Coming to the last one, enterotoxin. The word entero tells me I'm now going to deal with an intestine. So what is the enterotoxin going to cause? Let's take it up on a separate slide. Remember, enterotoxin causes food poisoning. Obviously, entero will cause something to do with food poisoning and that is what gets you the maximum questions. Remember, the incubation period of this food poisoning is less than 6 hours. It is 1 to 6 hours on an average. Average. So, less than 6 hours, if they give you a history in the exam, you are dealing with two things. If they say after consuming food, after eating food, within 6 hours, a person has landed up with food poisoning, either think of Staphylococcus aureus or think of Bacillus cereus. And which one is commoner? Remember, Staphylococcus aureus is more common. So, how will you differentiate in the exam? They will say incubation period was less than 6 hours. How will you get to know whether it is Staphylococcus aureus or Bacillus cereus? You will look out for the food. If they say there is any dairy or poultry consumption that has happened, dairy and poultry consumption, like for example, in the previous NEAT paper, there was a consumption, there was a birthday party and uh, everyone had consumed pastries. All the kids had consumed pastries. Now, pastry definitely has a lot of dairy creamy pastries they had consumed it has a lot of milk it has cream it has dairy so obviously you would have selected staphylococcus aureus so anything that is dairy and poultry go for staph aureus if they mentioned c for bacillus cereus c for chinese fried rice or chinese food you know what to select. So remember, dairy, poultry, select staph aureus, Chinese fried rice, Chinese food, select bacillus cereus. But if no food item is mentioned, if nothing is mentioned, only less than six hours is the time given, go for the commoner one, that is staphylococcus aureus. Now, please remember, enterotoxins are of many, many types. Enterotoxin A, B, C, D, like that. There are many, many types. All of them will cause food poisoning. All of them will cause food poisoning except enterotoxin F. Now, that is going to be something fishy. Enterotoxin F is going to be something fishy. It doesn't, although it looks like entero, it sounds like intestine problem. But there is something fishy. And what is that fishy thing in it? It doesn't cause any kind of food poisoning. It causes TSST. I hope everyone has heard of something known as Toxic shock syndrome toxin. Everyone's heard of toxic shock syndrome, TSS. So this toxin, toxin shock syndrome toxin, it causes TSS. And this toxin is known as a super antigen. It's not a regular antigen. It's a super antigen. So repeating guys, enterotoxin, entero word means intestine, but enterotoxin F is fishy. It doesn't cause intestine problem. It's a super antigen causing toxic shock syndrome. Having said that, why don't we attempt a few questions? If I say, which of the following staphylococcal toxin which is responsible for food poisoning? So, for food poisoning, what all do we have? Beta exotoxin, enterotoxin, alpha toxin and TSST. I think for food poisoning, intestine comes to our mind and enterotoxin is the best answer that we have. Right? Moving on to the next question. The protein A of Staphylococcus aureus, this is a PYQ of the FMG exam. The protein A of Staphylococcus aureus is present in cell wall, cell membrane. It's not seen in the Staph aureus or it's present as a toxin. So please remember, it is answer, correct answer we did in the beginning. Protein A is present in the cell wall of the bacteria. 
coming to the next question uh, so this is definitely something that can help us out of the 20 children that went to a party 11 developed abdominal pain diarrhea with nausea and vomiting around 6 hours after food consumption so out of the 20 children 11 have had it and the incubation period given to me is 6 hours most of the most likely agent that you have so i know that within 6 hours i have to think of staphylococcus aureus and I have to think of bacillus serious. Let me look at the options. I only have Staphylococcus aureus in the options. So the answer becomes very, very simple. They've not given me the type of food item consumed, but only by looking at the incubation period, I can make a guess. Okay, now you, this means you've done all the toxins that it can cause. Now, if we ask you that what are food poisoning was just one thing that you learned. If I ask you what are all the things that Staphylococcus aureus does, you learn it by the mnemonic known as soft pains. Please remember, soft pains mnemonic will help you learn everything that you need to know. So, what is it? Firstly, it causes all the soft tissue and skin infections. All the soft tissue and skin infections. Next, it causes OM, osteomyelitis. It causes osteomyelitis. F for food poisoning, we've done that. T for two conditions, 10 and TSS. I've told you the toxins. P for pneumonia and pneumatocel. In fact, everything that I've highlighted in yellow, the most common cause for those things are Staphylococcus. So, the most common cause for osteomyelitis, Staph aureus. Most common cause of pneumatocel and pneumonia, Staph aureus. Most common cause of infective arthritis, Staph aureus. So, repeating guys, we have S for skin soft tissue, O for osteomyelitis, food poisoning, 10 TSS, pneumonia, pneumatocel, acute endocarditis, infective arthritis, necrotizing fasciitis, lot of itis coming up way, acute endocarditis, infective arthritis, necrotizing fasciitis and sepsis. Out of which for OM, pneumatocel and infective arthritis, it's the most common. So if you get this kind of a question saying, secondary bacterial pneumonia in a post-influenza patient, post-influenza, post-viral infection, you can have a secondary bacterial infection. So secondary bacterial pneumonia, we just did pneumonias and pneumatoceles. We've just studied that Staphylococcus Pylococcus happens to be the commonest cause out here. I hope all these features are done and then we can move on forward and understand what are the different types of enzymes that it produces. What are all the enzymes that Staphylococcus produces? You can see five enzymes written over here and we've learnt it by the mnemonic Staphylococcus only. What do I mean by that? T for thermonuclease. Nuclease will remind you of DNAs. So remember thermonuclease or DNAs is one. PH for phosphatase. C and C for catalase and coagulase. Now, these are actually the most important. Staphylococcus aureus is catalase positive and coagulase positive. Repeating, thermonuclease and DNAs, PH for phosphatase, C for catalase, C for coagulase. How does the catalase test look like? Catalase test looks like this, guys. Please remember the easiest way is what is catalase? If I ask you what is the enzyme catalase capable of doing, you will say catalase is something which is capable of breaking H2O2. So what do I do? On this slide, I have taken one drop of H2O2. On this slide also, I have taken one drop of H2O2. On this, I've put, I don't know which organism is it. On this, I've put some kind of an organism on top of it. On this also, I've put some kind of organism. Right now, I don't know which is staph and which is not. Over here, I saw there are no bubbles. And over here, I saw that bubbles were produced. Remember, whenever bubbles will be produced, the catalase test will be set to be Positive. When is the catalase test positive? When bubbles are produced. Why? Because catalase enzyme breaks H2O2. H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide, right? Catalase breaks H2O2 into water and oxygen. And oxygen is responsible for bubbles. So simple. If Staphylococcus aureus is there, catalase will be there. Reaction will occur. Oxygen will form, bubbles will form. So, if catalase is there, bubbles will form. This means this organism was catalase positive. If catalase is not there, bubbles will not form. This means this organism is catalase negative. So, Staphylococcus aureus is catalase positive. There is another test that is known as the coagulase test. It is also an enzyme. 
but there are two ways of doing it you'll say ma'am like catalase test you were doing it on a slide similarly coagulase test you can either do it on a slide or you can do it in a test tube if you want to test for coagulase either you can do it on a slide or you can do it on a test tube the slide coagulase test is also known as the bound coagulase test and the test tube coagulase test is known as the free coagulase test how do i learn this because it's obviously becoming very overwhelming to learn so many things which is bound which is free which is slide which is tube count the number of alphabets free has four alphabets tube also has four alphabets so free and tube coagulase test are the same count the alphabets here slide has five alphabets bound has five alphabets so slide and bound are the same test that is how we learn it so slide and bound coagulase test tube and free coagulase test are the same and remember staph aureus intermediate and hicus staph aureus intermediate and hicus show you both positive both of them are going to be positive under it whereas staph lugdunensis see dunensis sounds like bound bound dunensis if you turn the uh, alphabets around bound dunensis so lugdunensis only shows you the bound test positive whereas staphylococcus schlieferi schlieferi sounds like free so schlieferi will give you the free coagulase test positive repeating guys all these aureus intermediates hicus both of them are positive for both the tests however schlieferi is free test positive lugdunensis is bound test positive let's attempt some questions so if they ask you which of the following organisms do not show the test below do not show what is the test below first you primarily have to identify that the test shown below is the test with the bubbles the bubbly test is said to be the catalase test it is said to be the catalase test so they are asking you which of the following organisms is not catalase positive or is catalase negative do you know the mnemonic for that remember uh, cats need space cats need space so the catalase positive organisms cats space that is staphylococcus aureus pseudomonas aspergillus candida enterobacter let's repeat cats need space so staphylococcus aureus pseudomonas aspergillus candida enterobacter coming back maybe we get something so for catalase the mnemonic that we said was space let's start repeating s for staphylococcus do we have staphylococcus over here it is catalase positive p for pseudomonas do we have pseudomonas over here positive a for aspergillus which is not over here c for candida i don't see candida over here e for enterobacter enterobacter is something which uh, is not enterococcus enterobacter would be definitely something to do with enterobacteriaceae family so that's an altogether different family that is positive enterococcus is not catalase positive talking about mycobacterium that is where i want to complete the mnemonic cats need space and space is being made that is how we learn we say cats need space and space is being made so space i know and being made will remind you of mycobacterium so yes mycobacterium is also catalase positive mycobacterium is also catalase positive so again cats need space let's learn cats means catalase needs space staphylococcus pseudomonas aspergillus candida enterobacter and space is being made with Which tells us that mycobacterium is also catalase positive. Well, having said that, let's move on to the next question. Which of the following statements is incorrect about the test shown below? Or let me just add on before I get to that question. Let me ask you this question first. I think it will be a better thing to do. Which of the following organisms do not show the test below? That's the better question. And this is a neat PG PYQ. This is a neat PG, and even the FMG students need to know this. So if you know this, you automatically know the other questions. do not show what test is this something said as positive something said as negative okay i don't know what test is it positive and negative is mentioned but i can see that it has been done in a test tube and all the staphylococcal organisms have been mentioned over here if it has been done in a test tube it could be a coagulase test it could be a coagulase test and what is the other name for tube coagulase test tube has four alphabets 
free has four alphabets yes so the free or the tube coagulase test is being done over here do i know there are three organisms that is staphylococcus aureus staphylococcus intermedius and staphylococcus hicus which show us both they show us both tests positive whether it is tube whether it is slide so staphylococcus aureus will be positive hicus will be positive let's talk about staphylococcal schlieferi i have learned schlieferi is free test positive definitely lugdunensis lugdunensis is only the bound test or the slide coagulase test positive so which of the following over here does not show the test below staphylococcus lugdunensis does not show this test it shows the bound or the slight coagulase test so i think the catalase and coagulase reaction seem to be well versed and finally we can go on to the diagnosis how do we do the diagnosis of staphylococcus aureus firstly do you guys know when i write staphylococcus what's the meaning of the word why did they call it staphylococcus so now today you'll get to know cocus means dot 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 bacteria dot like round you will say yes ma'am you can see these round round bacteria and why are they purple in color because i know all cocci are gram positive these are gram positive cocci so you just call it cocus why did you call it staphylo staphylo word means bunch of grapes can you see they are arranging like a bunch of grapes they are arranging like a bunch of grapes so the staphyl word means bunch of grapes and cocus means the cocci bacteria dot 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 okay then you say ma'am we've also called it staphylococcus aureus what is the reason for calling it staphylococcus aureus because aureus means golden the meaning of aureus is gold please remember staphylococcus can you all see what kind of a uh, what kind of a culture is this please remember what you see over here is known as a a nutrient agar we can probably take it on a separate slide have a look at this guys see this this is said to be a nutrient agar and on a nutrient agar i can see that there is a golden yellow pigment there is a golden pigment that it has produced golden is aureus that is why you call it staphylococcus aureus golden pigment is produced and the name of this pigment is staphylo because obviously it's staphylococcus xanthine staphylozanthine is the name of the pigment that's on a nutrient agar what is the next one the classical red color one and that is known as the blood agar and please remember in the blood agar can you see there's a dot and a light area around it a dot and the blackish area around it yes blood is being broken but very minimally there is something known as a narrow zone of hemolysis there is something known as a narrow zone of hemolysis please remember staphylococcus aureus on a nutrient agar shows you the golden yellow pigment and on a blood agar shows you a narrow zone of hemolysis last one what do you think are the selective media what is the selective media for selective and differential i'll tell you the difference between these two what is the selective and the differential media for staphylococcus aureus and that goes by the name of msa mannitol salt agar every word has a significance over here what have i called it i've called it mannitol salt agar firstly agar will tell you that yes it's a culture plate that you are using salt is what makes it selective salt is what makes it selective because who can grow in salt what do i understand by selective media only the desired bacteria will grow only and only the desired bacteria is going to grow means if you want to grow staphylococcus staphylococcus grows in salt others don't grow in salt so i'm using staphylococcus i'm using salt because staphylococcus grows in it okay so salt has made it selective and secondly what has made it differential differential means difference between what am i using over here mannitol mannitol has made it differential means i want to find out is it a mannitol fermenter or is it not a mannitol fermenter i'm differentiating is it a mannitol fermenter or not so that is why it makes it a differential medium please remember when there is mannitol fermentation present we are going to get a yellow color so if we get a yellow color means i'm dealing with a case of staph aureus means there is mannitol fermentation if we don't get a yellow color this means mannitol fermentation has not happened and this is not staph aureus repeating for everyone guys 
now when i come back on the culture so you can say three things number one i think everyone's understood what are you going to see on a nutrient agar on a nutrient agar you'll get a golden pigment what will you see on a blood agar you are going to see narrow zone of hemolysis and what are you going to see on a mannitol salt agar mannitol fermentation will be noted all of these point in favor of staph so if i make you answer a question now as per the images shown below which of these does not correlate with the culture characteristics of staphylococcus aureus which of these does not correlate with the culture characteristics of staphylococcus aureus options given are 1 2 Three and four. Let's start analyzing. Blood agar with a narrow zone. This is Staphylococcus aureus. Golden yellow pigment. Definitely yes. Mannitol fermentation. Definitely yes. The fourth one is the answer over here. It does not correlate. Why? Because if this is the organism, is this a narrow zone of breaking or it's a wide zone of hemolysis? A lot of red blood cells have broken. This is said to be. a wide zone of hemolysis and staph as far as i know staph does not show you a wide zone of hemolysis it shows you a narrow zone over here wide zone of hemolysis is streptococcus streptococcus not staphylococcus streptococcus pyogenes shows you a wide zone of hemolysis so that is exactly what we'll be reading next as well and that is what tells you that this does not correlate with the culture characteristics let's move forward go going on to the next question how does staphylococcus aureus become resistant to methicillin how does it become resistant to methicillin for those who read it you know that the answer is going to be the mec a gene and for those who have not then now we are going to study it so let's start with something very very basic what is the first thing that you would want to give the first thing that you would want to give would be penicillins or beta lactams penicillin or beta lactams but now it is said that there's a lot of resistance towards penicillin or beta lactams that is noted because of what gene because staphylococcus aureus produces something called beta lactamases if beta lactams are trying to act on staphylococcus staphylococcus will produce beta lactamases how do they make beta lactamases by the bla gene by the bla gene they make beta lactamases bla gene for beta lactamases and that is what makes them resistant to penicillin so if they become resistant to penicillin what are you going to give them you're going to give them methicillin but now they are saying because these bacteria have the mec a gene because they have the mec a gene they are now becoming see methicillin me because they have the meth a mec a gene they are becoming resistant to methicillin known as methicillin resistant staph aureus that is referred to as methicillin resistant staph aureus and if there is methicillin resistance that results in the treatment by vancomycin although now we even have vancomycin resistant staph aureus so resistance is ongoing because of the inadvertent use of so many antibiotics that is happening but yes ultimately when so much of resistance comes you have to do a culture sensitivity and find out that what is the antibiotic which will finally act upon it so basic first you give penicillin or beta lactams but if they have bla gene and beta lactamases they will become resistant so you give methicillin if the bacteria has mec a gene it will again become resistant so you give vancomycin now coming back to the question once again i had asked you how does staphylococcus aureus become resistant to methicillin so methicillin resistant by the mec a gene that was the answer over here i hope everyone sorted with this set of information also and we can move on to the next one organism causing iv biofilm organism causing iv iv biofilm what is that organism so four options staph epidermidis actinobacter meningococci mycobacterium so remember staph epidermidis is the answer over here what am i talking about please listen very carefully there is something known as cons what do you understand by cons cons means right now did i tell you that staphylococcus aureus when we were studying staphylococcus aureus did i tell you it is coagulase test positive and then i told you the two types of coagulase tube coagulase slide coagulase it was coagulase positive but remember there is a set of staphylococcus 
which is coagulase which is coagulase negative which is coagulase negative repeating co for coagulase and n for negative staphylococcus so coagulase negative staphylococcus is what you have to know how many types are there staph epidermidis and saprophyticus epidermidis gets you the maximum questions epidermidis makes a biofilm Biofilm is something, you know, this very commonly makes it in the IV cannulas. The IV cannulas, the intravenous cannulas that are put, that is where this grows and it makes a biofilm. What is the problem with the biofilm is that biofilm will make it very, very resistant to antibiotics. Biofilm is like a cage. It's like a protective cage. It will make it very difficult for the antibiotics to reach these organisms. So, Staph epidermidis has an IV biofilm and also it is involvement uh, or it is involved in prosthetic valve endocarditis prosthetic valve endocarditis association is also seen versus saprophyticus is very commonly seen with uti it's not that common but when regard to uti yes it can cause so repeating what we are asked you over here was organism causing iv biofilm and that is staph epidermidis repeating these are coagulase negative staph either you have staph epidermidis or you have staph saprophyticus this is the one that causes biofilm production let's move on to the next one staph epidermidis has become important due to biofilm formation virulence wide spectrum antibiotics novobiosin resistance so remember the most important point as to why stepi, staph epidermidis is in you know is important nowadays because of biofilm production iv biofilm that is exactly what we studied right now moving on to the next question granuloma in the lymph nodes is seen in all the infections except pyq fmg exam granuloma in the lymph nodes is seen so does tb show you granulomas definitely sarcoidosis certainly so does hemophilus ducre that also causes granulomatous inflammation what does not cause granulomatous inflammation is staphylococcus aureus it does not cause granulomatous inflammation Coming to the next one, which of the following organisms causes the fastest food poisoning? What did I understand by fastest? I told you anything under 6 hours. What were the two organisms under 6 hours? We said that we had Staphylococcus aureus and we had Bacillus cereus. And now let us find these options. Staphylococcus aureus is also there and Bacillus cereus is also there. So ideally this is not a perfectly framed question but since it came as a PYQ, you'll have to select one and the commoner one out of these two will be Staphylococcus aureus. Coming to the next question. A person ate some milk products in a party and after 6 hours started vomiting. So firstly, under 6 hours, again under 6 hours someone has had food poisoning which means Staphylococcus aureus and Bacillus cereus. What is the difference in the food consumption? In Staphylococcus aureus it is dairy and poultry. In Staphylococcus aureus dairy and poultry. In Bacillus cereus it is C for C that is Chinese fried rice or Chinese food. Here you had dairy product which means we are dealing with a case of Staphylococcus aureus. The same history comes to you with Chinese fried rice and your answer becomes Bacillus cereus. This also is a previous year question. Let's pick up the next question guys. Another PYQ your way. So you'll analyze that this topic is their all-time favorite. Food poisoning, two hours after intake of food, anything less than six hours again, Staph aureus, Bacillus cereus. Staph aureus and Bacillus cereus, though both are there in the options. I will have to select the commoner one. The commoner one is Staphylococcus aureus. Okay, all said and done, I think this set of bacteria is done and we can move on to the next one and I know the question comes across as a very, very um, overwhelming question with too many lengthy options. Let's read the question and then I think this one question finishes off everything about streptococcus that one is required to know. That's the beauty of this question. Let's read. Each of the following statements about the classification of streptococcus is correct except. So basically they've asked me which of these is the wrong statement. Whenever you read these kind of questions, make an analysis in your mind. What have they asked me? Have they asked me to pick the correct statements? No. They've said except. So in my mind, I've made an impression. Pick the one wrong statement. Find the one wrong statement out of these. 
so one by one i'll keep coming back to these options because there are so many options written over here but i think i first have to start with the classification of streptococcus that is something which is very very important the classification of streptococcus we'll start with so guys when i start with the classification how do i divide it i divide it on the basis of hemolysis how can it break red blood cells how can it break the blood agar so if i say that it only breaks it partially it only breaks blood partially or it breaks blood completely or it does not break blood simple so partial hemolysis complete hemolysis and gamma hemolysis means no hemolysis alpha beta gamma streptococca is what we have they will ask you the color so remember when blood is not broken at all there is no color blood will remain blood red color blood will remain red color blood but when blood is broken down either completely or partially on complete breakage blood will become yellowish in color on partial breakage it will become green in color how do i learn this a little tough right so what have i written we've written something called alpha we've written something called beta and we've written something called gamma gamma you've understood there is no hemolysis no color change no hemolysis alpha the way you write alpha is the same way that you write a g so what color does alpha hemolysis give alpha hemolysis gives a green color similarly the way you write a beta is the same way you write a y so what color does beta hemolysis give you it gives you a yellow color repeating alpha hemolysis gives you a green color beta hemolysis gives you a yellow color and gamma hemolysis does not give you any color so coming to the alpha category it has two things it has streptococcus viridens and streptococcus pneumoniae repeating streptococcus viridens and streptococcus pneumoniae come under alpha hemolysis under beta hemolysis we further have a classification which we call as the lansfield classification and under gamma hemolysis we have one organism called enterococcus so i think alpha and gamma are done alpha has viridens and pneumonia gamma has enterococcus this beta is what will attract further attention the beta is divided beta streptococcus has something called lansfield classification and what is lansfield classification can you see i've highlighted a c out of it so you will ask me that ma'am first tell me out of alpha beta gamma lansfield is done for what it is the beta one that is classified further on the basis of lansfield classification and what is the basis of this classification it says that it is going to divide it into many groups like group a group b group c group d so on and so forth but this classification is based on the c for carbohydrate antigen in the cell wall it is based on the carbohydrate antigen in the cell wall repeating c for lansfield classification c for carbohydrate antigen in the cell wall and this divides it into many many groups like group a group b group c group d so for example if i ever say i have a case of group a beta hemolytic streptococcus or i'll say i have a case of group b beta hemolytic streptococcus or i have a case of group c beta hemolytic streptococcus so first i'll mention the group and then i'll tell you that yeah i'm dealing with a beta hemolytic streptococcus so for the beta we have something called lansfield classification and that is based on the carbohydrate antigen so when i come back to the question guys when i come back to the question i do see one option over here it says viridens streptococci are identified by lansfield grouping firstly tell me viridens viridens belongs to which category as far as i just taught you viridens and pneumonia were belonging to the alpha category viridens is belonging to the alpha category and is alpha category identified by lansfield classification or is the beta category identified by lansfield classification so i have straight away found my wrong statement they've written that this is based on the carbohydrate antigen this part is right lansfield is based on carbohydrate antigen but it is done for the beta one it is not done for viridens it is not done for alpha so the wrong statement which one of these is wrong the wrong statement is option c one by one we'll start the other right ones also but the wrong or the incorrect statement that we have is option c
Okay, having said this, let's move forward. Now, out of all of these, I am going to consider group A beta hemolytic streptococcus. And what's the name? Group A beta hemolytic streptococcus. Remember, it is known as streptococcus pyogenes. Group A beta hemolytic streptococcus is streptococcus pyogenes and there's a you know superb mnemonic that you're going to get now when we are talking about group a beta hemolytic streptococcus group a beta hemolytic streptococcus if it is written like this in the exam don't get confused group a beta hemolytic streptococcus streptococcus pyogenes everything with pyogenes will be pi pi y that is how we've learned it Number one, how do you see it? You'll see it as chains. Remember, how is streptococcus seen? Streptococcus is seen in the form of chains. What is the transport media for pyogenes? Pi, pi. The transport media for pyogenes is the pikes media. What kind of colonies? You'll say, ma'am, it causes like a pin. Like a pin, it causes pinpoints. So, pyogenes, pikes media, pine point colonies, and how much of hemolysis? You'll say a very, very wide zone of hemolysis. It causes a wide zone. So remember, remember pi, 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 y. That is how we've learned it. Pyogenes, transport media, pikes media. Blood agar shows you pine point, pinpoint colonies. And it has a wide zone of hemolysis around it. That is what is said to be streptococcus pyogenes. I hope up till now it is making sense. Further, you'll want to study the biochemical reactions. That also you'll learn with the word streptococcus pyogenes only. Means what? You'll say first and foremost, right now, we had done all the catalase positive organisms. Remember we said cats need space and space being made. Do you remember that mnemonic? So S was for staphylococcus. We'll repeat. We had staphylococcus, pseudomonas, aspergillus, candida, enterobacter, Mycobacterium. Streptococcus was not there. Streptococcus has nothing to do with catalase. It is a catalase negative organism. Coming to the next. Remember, it is S for sensitive. It is bacitracin sensitive. It is bacitracin sensitive. And PY plus pyogenes. I've written it as PY plus because it is PYR test positive. It's a very complicated reaction and you don't need to know the reaction as such for the exam. But you need to know that remember step, uh, streptococcus pyogenes is sensitive for bacitracin and PYR test is going to be positive. I hope that is somewhere making sense because we can move on to the question. Let's attempt this question. A lengthy one. So let's read it. An 8-year-old boy is brought to the emergency room with a 3-day history of fever, pretty high fever, 102 degree Fahrenheit and abdominal pain. He complains of pain in his right knee as well as elbow. So, there's joint involvement, there's high fever, there is abdominal pain. And 4 weeks ago, he was seen for sore throat and a rash. The throat culture had shown gram-positive cocci in chains and antibiotic was given. Remember, gram-positive cocci in chains. Gram-positive cocci means purple color and they are in chains. Have you started thinking of streptococcus pyogenes? Because streptococcus pyogenes also causes sore throat. Definitely. And it is present in chains. Further, I see physical examination. The temperature is high. Uh, the blood pressure, the heart rate are mentioned. So, there's nothing very catchy in the heart rate and the blood pressure. We see that there is definitely tenderness in the joints that is there because arthralgia, arthritis is noted. Laboratory tests show C-reactive protein as positive. C-reactive protein is definitely an inflammatory marker. Bacterial infection, CRP will come positive. WBC 22,000. The normal WBC is 4,000 to 11,000. Over here, the WBC has come out to be elevated as 22,000. ECG shows you prolonged PR interval. Where are we moving towards? We are moving towards heart involvement. There is a prolonged PR interval. All of these are features of TLC being high, C-reactive protein being positive, the joint involvement that was mentioned over here, the fever that was mentioned over here, and finally, the cardiac involvement mentioned over here. We are dealing with the case of rheumatic heart disease, rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease. And I know that streptococcus pyogenes definitely causes rheumatic heart disease. Which of the 
following tests would be positive now tell me uh, have i taught you catalase and coagulase in streptococcus no catalase and coagulase was staphylococcus now i come to these antibiotics did i just now teach you that there is bacitracin sensitivity noted so the answer over here definitely becomes option c and that is sensitivity to bacitracin so i'm giving you all a little bit of a homework now that we've studied streptococcus pyogenes and we've studied everything around it in terms of micro i want all of you to go and study the criteria for rheumatic heart disease because everything mentioned here was a case of rheumatic heart disease so i know you know the name of the criteria the revised jones criteria just not jones criteria the revised jones criteria I want all of you to open up your medicine notes, read up the revised Jones criteria, something which is very, very important both in pediatrics and medicine. And once you're done, it's a kind of an attendance. Once you're done reading with the revised Jones criteria, you have to write a done and a thumbs up in the chat below, in the comments below. A done with a thumbs up will tell me that you were listening throughout the session. And secondly, that you've done your bit of homework. Okay, let's have another question discussion over here. Streptococcus Biogenes can be checked by which drug, which antibiotic? Did I just study? Streptococcus biogenes is bacitracin sensitive. So, which is the antibiotic or drug disc that we will use? It will be bacitracin. I hope that's okay. Group A beta hemolytic streptococcus is done. Let's move on to the other group. Now let's go on to group B beta hemolytic streptococcus and that is known as streptococcus agalecti. Streptococcus agalecti which uh, is involving, you know, it can involve the young children also, the neonates also as well as the adults. It can cause brain involvement as well. It can cause meningitis also, pneumonia also. So streptococcus agalecti, like I said, it can affect the neonates it can also affect the adults or older children you can say rather than adults i'll prefer going for the word older children it can cause meningitis it can cause pneumonia and there are two tests that you have to learn for agalecti what are the two tests it is camp test positive and hippurate hydrolysis positive repeating camp test positive and hippurate hydrolysis positive out of them, they will always ask you what is a CAMP test. Firstly, if you want to know the full form of CAMP, it is Christy Atkins Munch Peterson. It stands for Christy Atkins Munch Peterson, but these are names of scientists. And honestly, if you skip this information, there's nothing that you're going to lose out here. CAMP is the full form, I've told you, nothing to learn. But what is the CAMP test and what exactly am I seeing over here? That is something that I would want all of you to focus on. So what is the CAMP test, guys? You can see what kind of a medium have I taken up over here. I've taken something called the blood agar. You can see the reddish color media. I've taken something called a blood agar. And on a blood agar, what have I done? I have done a vertical streak of Staphylococcus aureus. I have done a vertical streak over here of Staphylococcus aureus and perpendicular to it, perpendicular to it, one perpendicular line here, one perpendicular line here. As of now, I don't know what perpendicular line from the patient. This is patient number one and uh, maybe this is a known patient number two. Right now, I don't know. Are they suffering from Streptococcus agalecti or not? So over here, what's the difference between patient 1 and patient 2? You said in patient 1, at the junction of your sample and Staphylococcus aureus, you saw an arrowhead that was formed. Whereas in patient number 2, there is no arrowhead that is formed. So remember, when the arrowhead will form, that will indicate that the CAMP test is positive. <coughs> I'm sorry. When the arrowhead will form, that will indicate that the CAMP test is positive. So remember, you have to look out for this particular arrowhead here, then CAMP test is positive. If it's not there, this means the CAMP test is negative. Repeating, they will ask you for the labelings, guys. That's the most important thing out here. Vertically, what do you do? Staphylococcus aureus. Perpendicular, you put the patient sample, like over here, Streptococcus agalecti, and you found that arrowhead. Very, very important test. Okay, having said that, you've done with, let us see, let us do a checklist. What all have we done? We had alpha, beta, gamma category, right? We had something called alpha, beta and gamma category. Out of that, the beta category is done. The Lansfield classification, we've done group A, beta hemolytic streptococcus, which was streptococcus pyogenes. We've done group 
B beta hemolytic streptococcus which is streptococcus agalecti let me move on to the next one let me move on to gamma hemolysis then we'll come back to alpha let us move on to gamma hemolysis and uh, gamma hemolysis means what gamma means no hemolysis there is no hemolysis that is going to occur and what is there under gamma hemolysis is enterococcus what is there under gamma hemolysis it is enterococcus so how do i learn enterococcus from the name enterococcus itself the mnemonic of enterococcus is enterococcus itself so we'll try and decode the mnemonic the way you write an e over here you can make the e into a spectacle you can make an e into a spectacle because this is a spectacle gram positive cocci the shape of it is that of a spectacle so that's the first e you've changed it into a spectacle now we come to the next that is n n means it has no 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 it has no motility it does not show you hemolysis gamma hemolysis and nacl 6.5% it can survive remember no hemolysis no motility nacl requirement 6.5% t for tolerant it is tolerant to heat e for i've changed the e again every time i get an e i change it first i changed it into a spectacle looking now i've changed it into a b because this grows in the presence of bile how much percent bile 40% bile that is why if i ask you that you want to grow a particular enterococcus which kind of medium will you use you will say ma'am i'll use the beea medium beea medium is bile esculin azide agar even if you don't learn the full form nothing to worry just remember beea is something that has bile and if enterococcus will grow on it what color has it got you it's got you a black color so remember bile and black have to go with enterococcus bile and black have to go with enterococcus coming back so the e i have changed into a b bile esculin azide agar gives us a black color growth finally we come to the last one and that is r there is some reaction which is positive and which reaction is positive pyr reaction is positive pyr test is positive so repeating guys e for spectacle n for non motile non hemolytic nacl 6.5% t for tolerant e again for b bile bile 40% bea black color and reaction pyr test positive why don't we go back to the question that we were studying are we able to rule out something over here enterococcus are group d streptococci and can be classified by their ability to grow on 6.5% nacl did we just study that enterococcus can grow on a 6.5% nacl yes n for nacl 6.5% so that is certainly making sense out here so this statement becomes the true statement fine having said that now we are done with the alpha category uh, now we are done with the beta category the gamma category we can straight away come down to the alpha category what all comes under alpha there are two things alpha hemolytic has viridens group versus pneumonia group pneumococcus streptococcus viridens versus streptococcus pneumococcus uh, strepto pneumococcus or pneumonia that is what comes under the alpha category how do i differentiate between them so remember the difference is primarily on these two rather than shapes the difference is primarily on these two remember viridens has ri you will always remember r for resistant what is it resistant to it is optochin resistant it is optochin resistant and i for insoluble what insoluble it is bile insoluble repeating for you guys r for resistant it is optochin resistant and i for insoluble it is going to be bile insoluble if you've learnt viridens pneumococcus is the opposite this was optochin resistant pneumococcus becomes optochin sensitive this was bile insoluble pneumococcus becomes soluble so simple way of learning pneumococcus is soluble and sensitive it is soluble and sensitive whereas viridens viridens is going to be insoluble and resistant okay so having said that now i can again get back to the options but before i get back let me just finish it off what do they cause common sense what do you think streptococcus pneumococcus will cause it will obviously cause a case of pneumonia it will cause pneumonia in it and what does viridens cause viridens causes endocarditis viridens is very famous for causing endocarditis next question they ask you viridens is present in chains 
Viridins is an organism that is present in chains and pneumococcus is an organism that is lens shaped, lanceolate with a capsule. Let me show you a photo. This is the photo of streptococcus pneumoniae or pneumococcus. Like I said, it is lanceolate with a capsule. It is lanceolate with a capsule. When I try to grow it on a culture, when we try to culture streptococcus pneumoniae, we get something known as Either you can call it a Drotsman colony, either you can call it a Drotsman colony or you can call it a Carom coin colony. It is also known as a Carom coin colony. So, repeating Drotsman colony or Carom coin colony. Why so? How does a Carom coin look like? Carom coin is elevated in the periphery, depressed in the center. Does it look exactly like this? Elevated in the periphery, depressed in the center. Elevated in the periphery, depressed in the center. Yes. So, remember Carom coin or Drotsman colony is what you see with Streptococcus pneumoniae. Plus, did you see that this lanceolate also had a capsule around it that's a very very important point it is a capsulated organism means streptococcus pneumoniae is made up of capsular polysaccharide and on the basis of capsular polysaccharide you can divide it into many subtypes there are almost over 90 subtypes that are known of streptococcus pneumoniae on the basis of the capsular polysaccharide so if i ask you that on the basis of capsular polysaccharide can you do the typing of streptococcus pneumoniae yes the typing of it can be done and there's a very famous reaction for any organism with capsule. Like for example, if you say ma'am, Haemophilus influenza also has a capsule. Streptococcus pneumonia has a capsule. So all of them which have a capsule, they show something called the Quellung reaction positive. What do I mean by Quellung reaction? Please let's draw a diagram. For example, if this is the bacteria, this is the bacteria and this is the capsule on top of it. So, do you all agree that every capsule will definitely have an antigen? Every capsule will have an antigen and I know that if I add anti-capsular antibody, if I add an antibody against it, ideally will the antigen-antibody reaction occur? Will that ideally take place? Yes, this already has an antigen. If I add an antibody, then the reaction will take place. Don't you think this capsule will swell up in that case? If there is a reaction that will occur, if the reaction will occur, I will see that the capsule will swell up. There will be capsular swelling that will be noted. So, please remember guys, uh, that is known as the Quellung reaction. It's the swelling of the capsule on adding anti-capsular serum. That is what you get in a case of streptococcus pneumoniae or you also call it pneumococcus in that manner. Okay, now let me come back and visit the question. Let us read option first. Streptococcus pneumoniae are alpha hemolytic. Yes, alpha hemolytic are two things, viridins and streptococcus pneumoniae. And these can be typed on the basis of the polysaccharide capsule right now exactly what we studied. It definitely can. Let's go on to the last option. Although pneumococci and viridins are alpha hemolytic, correct, pneumococci and viridins are alpha hemolytic, they can be differentiated by bile solubility and susceptibility to optogen. Exactly my mnemonic. Do you remember the mnemonic for viridins? I have taught you that viridins R will tell me that it is optogen resistant and I will tell me that it is bile insoluble whereas pneumococcus for pneumococcus we said that it ends with an s so everything is s bile it is soluble optogen it is sensitive so can they be differentiated on the basis of these findings certainly can and finally this question like i said in the beginning the beauty of this question is that the entire streptococcus chapter can be finished within the domains of this and i think we've managed to do that wonderfully so please remember something very very important this entire question only per se is very important right so well having said that i think we can take up another question a 30-year-old patient presented with fever, presented with headaches and presented with vomitings. He had a splenectomy few years ago. What is the most probable uh, organism? So actually, this is again a question which can have multiple options, right? Uh, whenever there is a person who's undergone splenectomy, maximum chances of infection happen to be with capsulated organisms like pneumococcus, H-influenza, 
even meningococcus pneumococcus h influenza meningococcus basically these are the kind of things which probably get you uh, which have a capsule right these are the things which have a capsule and spleen helps you fight capsulated organisms please remember spleen is something that helps you fight against capsulated organisms and now i'm saying that uh, the spleen is removed the spleen has been removed this means you cannot fight against you will be susceptible person will be susceptible to all these capsulated so like i said there are two best answers that you'll get over here pneumococcus meningococcus going in the order of more importance pneumococcus stands better but yes both of them are important because capsulated organisms are being mentioned over here so i suppose that is done let's move on to the next question a patient presents with signs of pneumonia the bacterium obtained from sputum was a gram positive coccus which showed alpha hemolysis on sheep agar which showed alpha hemolysis on sheep agar repeating you have a case of pneumonia and alpha hemolysis under alpha group i only know two organisms one is viridens and the other is going to be pneumococcus but remember pneumococcus is something which is obviously going to cause pneumonia so i know i'm dealing with a case of streptococcus pneumonia which of the following test will help you give the diagnosis do you remember how do we differentiate between viridens and pneumococcus number 1 we look for bile solubility number 2 we look for optochin out of those two i have bile solubility mentioned over here and i know pneumococcus ends with s it is bile soluble that's the answer moving on to the next one the easiest one i can say of the session drotsman appearance of colonies right now i told you drotsman appearance of colony also known as the carom coin colonies they are associated with streptococcus pneumoniae strepto not general streptococcus streptococcus pneumoniae that is nothing but pneumococcus so yes that is the final answer that you have I hope all the set of PYQs seem sorted for everyone. They are not very tough. Staff and strepto seem to be done. In fact, we'll also take up one more, uh, you know, one more set of organisms over here. If you remember, when we started off, the first thing that I told you was all the cocci are gram positive except Neisseria, Moraxella, and Velonella. all of them are gram positive except neisseria moraxella and velonella and now i can finally come to the negative one means i can come to neisseria and this means that i am still dealing with those dot dot cocci but now i have made them gram negative so we have two types of neisseria in front of us neisseria meningitidis which will always cause meningitis and neisseria gonorrhoeae which will always cause gonorrhea means genital infections before i start going with them are they naturally present in the body do they have a natural habitat in our body yes they do they definitely cause diseases but they have a natural habitat remember neisseria meningitidis is commonly present and normally present in the nasopharynx whereas neisseria gonorrhoeae is present in the genital region and this is their natural habitat so neisseria meningitidis near the meningitis near the brain you have nasopharynx and neisseria gonorrhoeae is for genital next how do you differentiate them we differentiate them on their ability to ferment something on their ability to ferment something so please remember when we are talking about neisseria meningitidis it has m as well as g means it will ferment maltose as well as glucose whereas neisseria gonorrhoeae only has g so it will only ferment glucose not maltose repeating uh, they will ask you that neisseria meningitidis ferments maltose glucose both you will say meningitidis has m also g also so maltose and glucose both whereas gonorrhea does not have m it does not ferment maltose it only ferments glucose so can i say glucose fermentation is being carried out by both it is the main differentiating point is maltose fermentation because maltose is something which only meningitidis will ferment and not gonorrhea yes moving on coming to the next how do they look like what is the difference in their appearance the shape over there so remember meningitidis the way you write meningitidis you write an m you can make a lens like appearance out of it 
it's a lens lanceolate or a lens like appearance and it has a capsule around it repeating the way you write m you are going to make a lens out of it and it has a capsule around it whereas gonorrhea the way you write g and g you can make kidneys out of it so gonorrhea is said to be the bean shaped or it is said to be the kidney shaped remember the meningitis is, is lanceolate or lens shaped with a capsule whereas bean shaped gonorrhea is going to be like a g like a kidney out of them which of them has a capsule repeating again meningitis has a capsule moving on what do they cause common sense meningitis will cause meningitis and gonorrhea will cause genital infections that is std i don't think you need a mnemonic for that right meningitis will cause meningitis and gonorrhea will cause std what else meningitis is also famous for calling for causing bilateral adrenal hemorrhage it is very famous for causing adrenal gland it causes bilateral adrenal gland hemorrhage that is also known as waterhouse fredrickson syndrome waterhouse fredrickson syndrome is something which is bilateral adrenal gland hemorrhage which is seen with neisseria meningitis next neisseria gonorrhea i know it causes std i also know in ophthal that it causes ophthalmia neonatorum in the neonates how do they get the infection how do the neonates get this infection while they are passing through the birth canal the mother has neisseria gonorrhea and while they are passing through the birth canal during birth during a normal vaginal delivery that is when they get the infection and they present with ophthalmia neonatorum what else Neisseria gonorrhea can also cause the FHC syndrome. What is FHC syndrome? Fitz Hugh Curtis syndrome. Fitz Hugh Curtis syndrome is nothing but a case of peri hepatitis inflammation around the liver fibrosis around the liver around the liver peri hepatitis happens in fitz hugh curtis syndrome there are many other organisms even chlamydia can cause fitz hugh curtis syndrome we will be studying about that eventually but one organism as of now which can cause it is neisseria gonorrhea okay all said and done let's do a quick recap when i'm dealing with meningitis obviously it will cause meningitis and waterhouse fredrickson syndrome gonorrhea will cause std child passing through the canal of thalmia neonatorum and complication fitz hugh curtis syndrome coming to the next one that is what is the uh, media which media do you grow it in both of them can be grown in a charcoal based media called thea martin medium both the neisseria thea martin medium if you want to learn something additional gonorrhea can also be grown in the modified new york agar but what you have to have to learn is the thea martin medium for both the neisseria and what is the transport media the transport media is the stewards or the amies media the stewards or the amies media happens to be the transport media so let's repeat thea martin medium for growth Stuart uh, do you all remember there was a movie a cartoon movie animated movie called called uh, Stuart Little it was on uh, on a on a mouse Stuart Little so Stuart Little was always a mouse always running around always moving around so moving around transportation Stuart and Amy's media transport media and Thea Martin medium is the growth medium finally what is any any one of them which has any kind of a vaccine yes remember neisseria meningitis is the meningococcal vaccine the meningococcal vaccine has all these types in it first please remember when we are talking about neisseria meningitis neisseria meningitis has capsule like we said it looks like a lens and it has a capsule so capsule polysaccharides are type a type b type c type y type w135 repeating what all is this we have a b c y and w135 on the basis of capsule these are the types of neisseria so meningococcus a b c y w135 remember out of all these all of them are used in the vaccine but b is not used in the vaccine b is not used in the vaccine please remember that's again a pyq that you guys have got so let's start probably attempting one or two questions and i think that will make more sense 
the site where neisseria meningitidis bacteria harbor normally remember neisseria meningitidis present normally we said that they are present in skin genitals nasopharynx or lower git they are normally present in nasopharynx so neisseria meningitidis in nasopharynx and what's in the genitals neisseria gonorrhoeae was present in the genitals okay moving on to the next question which of the following is a gram negative diplococci first cocci let's pick up the cocci you'll see ma'am right now we studied staphylococcus it's a coccus we studied streptococcus that is also a coccus neisseria is also a coccus corine bacterium diphtheria is not a coccus we haven't studied it as of now it's a bacillus so firstly that doesn't make any sense option is ruled out they've asked me cocci i know that all cocci are gram positive but i know that neisseria meningitidis what were the three exceptions exceptions neisseria moraxella velonella neisseria moraxella velonella they are gram negative and that is what they've asked me they've asked me the cocci which is gram negative so neisseria over here is the best answer that i have moving on to the next one meningococcal vaccine cannot be used for which of the following serotypes do you remember there were five serotypes that we studied a b c y and w135 out of which i said which of them is not there for a vaccine or meningococcal vaccine is not used against which strain it is not used against serotype coming to the next one which of the following is a kidney shaped bacteria again very very simple kidney shaped i just told you there's a g and there's a g and you make a kidney out of it so neisseria gonorrhoeae or gonococcus neisseria gonorrhoeae or gonococcus is a kidney shaped bacteria as we proceed in bacteriology we will be doing the shapes of all of these undoubtedly but as of now yes neisseria gonorrhoeae is going to be a kidney shaped bacteria so when we come back these are all that you had to know with regard to the cocci now moving forward we'll also be going to the bacilli now usually i say usually i say that all the bacilli are gram negative all the bacilli are gram negative except mcdonalds so let's start with that all the bacilli means bacilli will no longer be dot dot bacilli will be rod shaped all the bacilli are going to be gram negative except mycobacterium anthrax clostridium diphtheria mcdonald no nocardia actinomyces listeria i know right now all of a sudden you know it will feel um, as if a big list has come on top of us and you know we can't learn too much of it and there's no pressure right now because we are gradually going to read all of these organisms and they'll organically enter into our system as of now i know that all the bacilli are going to be gram negative but there's one bacillus which is i'm going to teach you right now and that is corine bacterium diphtheria so that is what we'll be starting off with next please remember remember when i'm talking about corine bacterium diphtheria it is not it is a bacilli but it is not gram negative it belongs to that rare variety the mcdonald variety of gram positive bacilli gram positive bacilli and it has nothing else it doesn't have any motility it has no spore forming ability it has no capsule problem in it so no motility no sporing no capsule nothing at all and it's belonging to that mcdonald variety repeating all bacilli all the bacilli are going to be gram negative except for mcdonalds and right now out of all of those i'm only telling you to learn d for diphtheria corine bacterium diphtheria so first question that will come to your mind is that how many types of these do you have actually we just call it corine bacterium we just call it as a family of corine bacteria and everyone please listen to me for say 15 more minutes and then we'll take up all the questions in the end first let us read everything that is important for corine bacteria and then we proceed to the questions so when i'm talking about corine bacteria there is something called corine bacterium diphtheria which is known as lofler's bacilli everything about corine bacterium diphtheria will have the word lofler in it because the primary scientist for all the contribution was lofler so remember corine bacterium diphtheria lofler's bacillus then there are non diphtheroids non diphtheroids include listen carefully corine bacterium ulcerans what do i learn u for ulcerans and l for which organ can you see that is involved over here 
lung involvement is seen. So, carini bacterium ulcerans, U for ulcerans, L for lung involvement, lung infection. Carini bacterium pseudotuberculosis. So, pseudotuberculosis, what do you say? P4, it is also known as the Pre's nocard bacillus. And S4, this causes infection in animals, that is sheep. Repeating, uh, Carini bacterium ulcerans, U for ulcerans, L for lung involvement. Carini bacterium pseudotuberculosis, P for presnocard bacillus, S for sheep. And Carini bacterium minutissimum, Carini bacterium minutissimum causes a red erythro. Erythro always means red. It causes a red color rash on the skin. Obviously, skin rash, a red coral red rash it causes. So, these are the non-diphtheroids. Uh, right now, I'm focusing on Carini bacterium diphtheria, which is Loeffler's bacillus. And it is said, you'll say, okay, ma'am, what all does it cause? First, I'll tell you what, does, what disease does it cause? Common sense. Carini bacterium diphtheria will obviously cause a disease called diphtheria, right? So, what is diphtheria if I ask you that? Uh, diphtheria can be of many, many types. Diphtheria can happen uh, in the respiratory tract. It can happen in the tonsillar location. Along the respiratory tract, it can happen in the larynx. So, I'll show you some, uh, you know, areas and some pictures which will help you. So, the first picture that you see out here, you can see that there is a pseudo membrane that is formed. There is is a pseudo membrane that is formed can you see in which area it is formed in the soft palate and the tonsillar area because diphtheria very classically involves the most common location affected is the tonsillar area the fascial area the respiratory area but the most dangerous you do understand that laryngopharynx if a membrane imagine if this kind of a membrane is formed on the larynx a person would not be able to breathe there will be respiratory obstruction that will occur and that will make it life-threatening so if someone asks you which is the most dangerous uh, you know the most uh, dangerous type of uh, Carini bacterium diphtheria manifestation that is in the larynx what else it also involves the lymph nodes and the area of the neck the neck becomes very very swollen and edematous so you call it the bull's neck remember there's a membrane formed there is bull's neck formed the membrane in the tonsillar region is the most most common location and in the larynx is the most 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 dangerous location that is what diphtheria is but does that mean that every Carini bacterium diphtheria will end up having uh, resulting in diphtheria in the patient means each one of us whenever this enters into our body we will end up with diphtheria no because all the Carini bacterium diphtheria are not toxigenic all of them are not carrying the toxin some of them carry the toxin which toxin am I talking about obviously the tox gene for toxin production Carini bacterium diphtheria should have the tox gene. So, for example, these are two Carini bacterium diphtherias that you have. This one has the tox gene. This one does not have the tox gene. This has the tox gene. So, you will say, ma'am, this is going to be toxigenic. It is going to make toxin. It is going to result in infection. And this one you will call as non-toxigenic. So, basically, it's whether they have the tox gene or not. So, for example, this one has the tox gene. This one is toxigenic it is causing the disease can it pass on the gene to some other Carini bacterium can it pass it on to this one this one doesn't have the tox gene can it pass it on yes beta phage bacteriophage bacteriophage can take up the tox gene from here and pass it on to here what is that known as because we studied it in the second part of general microbiology that is bacteriophage transferring one gene from here to here that is known as transduction so can i say that all Carini bacterium diphtheria don't have the toxin some of them have the toxin some of them don't but if you want to transfer the toxin from one place to another you can use bacteriophage or transduction so they will also ask you that how do you get to know how do you get to know whether you are uh, if i give you bacteria number one and i give you bacteria number two this is also Carini bacterium this is also Carini bacterium i ask you which of them is toxic and which of them is not which of them is toxigenic which of them is non-toxigenic what test will you do this testing methodology is known as lx gel precipitation test this methodology is lx gel precipitation test and listen to me very carefully what are we doing in it what preparations do i have to do 
I will take a filter paper. I'm going to take a filter, brown color filter paper over here. And I'm going to put antitoxin of Corine bacterium, not the toxin. I've put an antitoxin solution on this filter paper and kept it over here. Perpendicular to it, I'll put three lines. What are these three lines? Over here, I'll put a, put a filter paper. And I know this is not from the patient. It is a known Corine bacterium diphtheria, which I know it has a toxin. That Corine bacterium diphtheria I will put over here. So think logically, the toxin, I know it has a toxin. So the toxin is over here. And on the filter paper, you have anyway put the antitoxin. Will a reaction occur? If the toxin is here and the antitoxin is here, you'll say, yes, ma'am, you can see those precipitin lines forming. Those precipitin lines will tell me that reaction has occurred, toxin was there. What have I done over here? Abhi tak I've not gone to the patient. Here I had put a toxigenic strain. Here I have put a non-toxigenic strain. It does not have the toxin. Now do you think any lines will form? This does not have the toxin. Will any lines form? It will not. So first I know that over here I had put a toxigenic strain. So lines had formed. Over here I have put a non-toxigenic strain. So lines have not formed. And now finally in the center I put the unknown. I put the sample. I don't know whether my patient has a toxigenic strain or a non-toxigenic strain. But when I put the sample over here, I saw these lines. Now tell me, if the lines are coming positive, is it a toxigenic or a non-toxigenic strain? You will say, ma'am, it is a toxigenic strain. So have you understood the utility of the LX gel precipitation test? Firstly, it's just a toxin-antitoxin reaction. If you see the precipitin lines, toxin is there. If you don't see the precipitin lines, the toxin is not there. And is the toxin always present? Not at all. Toxin is transported via what? Via a bacteriophage. That's the story of toxin. Now let's look at how it looks under the microscope. So first and foremost, we know Corine bacterium diphtheria is a bacilli. Bacilli will always look lengthy like a rod. Perfect. I have studied all gra all uh, bacilli are gram negative, but Corine bacterium diphtheria belonged to the McDonald mnemonic. So it is gram positive. That is why you can see that it has come out purple in color because it is gram positive. But do you see some weird shapes? I, V, L. Because Corine bacterium diphtheria is very famous for having the Chinese letter or the cuneiform appearance. It is very famous for having Chinese letter or cuneiform appearance. Okay. Further, if you have ever have to zoom into it, you will see that Corine bacterium diphtheria looks something like this. You will see some knobs at the term, terminal portions. You will see some knobs. I will show you another picture. Have a look at this. Can you see, pick up anyone. Can you see there are two prominent round circles at the poles. There are prominent circles that are present. What are those known as? Those are known as four names. Volutin granules. They are at the poles. So we call them bipolar granules. Babesons granules. And metachromatic granules. There are four names. All four of them are the names of the same thing. Let's repeat. What are the four things? We have volutin granules, bipolar granules, Babesons granules and metachromatic granules. And what are the stains for them? There are three stains that you can use. Pan stains can be used for staining the volutin granules. Ponder stain, Albert stain, Neisser stain. Everyone learn with me. When I want to stain these round round granules, I have Ponder stain, Albert stain, Neisser stain, Pan stains are there. What is the picture given here of? The picture here is of Albert stain. What is Albert stain? Albert stain is the Tim Tim stain. What is the Tim Tim stain meaning? Means the first thing in Albert that I will be adding will be toluidine blue. The very first thing that I will be adding will be toluidine blue. The next thing that I will be adding will be iodine. It will be iodine. And the third thing that I will be putting up over here is going to be malachite green. We will have malachite green. So let's do a recap. Number one, we'll have toluidine blue, a blue purple kind of a stain, then iodine and then a greenish stain. So remember the bacteria is going to come green. This malachite green is going to make the bacteria green. And finally, what is going to make it purple? 
the toluene blue will make the volutin granules purple now does it look like this let's repeat if you see the organism has stained green because of malachite green and the volutin granules have stained purple because of toluene blue so volutin granules or bipolar or babesons or metachromatic granules they are all stained purple because of toluene blue and the organism has been stained green because of malachite green remember this is the tim tim staining protocol call of albert staining but other than albert what are the other stains that we can use we can use ponders we can use albert and we can use neeser stain but are volutin granules specific are they only and only seen in corini bacterium diphtheria no they are also seen in other organisms remember what is the mnemonic for volutin granules one thing you will remember corini bacterium diphtheria definitely but other than corini bacterium diphtheria you see it in v n g s first letter last letter first letter last letter so g and s means gardenella and spirillum repeating gardenella and spirillum v and n i make a little bit of a change v is also looking like y so yeast and n is also looking like m so mycobacterium tuberculosis let's do a recap we have number 1 we have uh, the volutin v so v looks like a y so i say yeast n looks like an m so mtb g for gardenella and s for spirillum along with corini bacterium diphtheria all of them have volutin granules but if i ask you what are these granules if someone asks you what is the composition of these volutin granules remember they are made up of energy they have nothing but energy they are energy sources they are polymetaphosphate they are polymetaphosphate again something that could come to you in the potential question i would say volutin granules are polymeta phosphate i hope that is okay with everyone so if you want to identify first you look at it under the gram stain the chinese letter appearance next you look at the volutin granules and finally you say let's grow it on culture media what are the culture media that you have for the diagnosis of diphtheria culture media are two enriched culture media selective culture media we must know the difference what is an enriched medium in general whenever i say something is enriched will mean you have made it very very rich means i have added a lot of things in this media i have made it very very rich i have given it a lot of food in this media i have kept so much of food and so much of nutrients i have kept inside it that this diphtheria when i put it on top of this media it will get all that food and grow very very fast so when i say i am dealing with an enriched media it means that the media has a lot of nutrients a lot of food and the bacteria is going to have a feast the bacteria is going to have a party out there because the bacteria will come across so much of food so much of nutrients it will eat quickly it will become big fat and grow and if it grows i'll be able to see it that is an enriched media remember enriched if we see the example that i've given over here is lss loffler sedum slope did i tell you in the beginning that everything with diphtheria will have the word loffler in it corini bacterium diphtheria is also known as the loffler's bacillus so the name of the enriched media for diphtheria is loffler sedum slope one more very interesting thing that i'll point out over here count the number of alphabets in enriched it has eight alphabets count the number of alphabets in loffler eight alphabets and how many hours does the bacteria take to grow in this the bacteria takes 6 to 8 hours repeating enriched has eight alphabets loffler has eight alphabets eight hours is the time taken for the bacteria to grow in an enriched loffler medium versus a selective medium selective means selectively only this will grow every other bacteria staph strepto all other bacteria will be suppressed selectively only one thing is going to shine out and that is corini bacterium diphtheria pta potassium telluride agar which takes very long 48 hours and can you see this blackish color this blackish color is what you get on a potassium telluride agar so repeating for all of you guys enriched eight alphabets loffler eight alphabets takes eight hours selective media is potassium telluride agar which takes 48 hours so if someone asks you which is the fastest media or the faster method of growing diphtheria the faster method is going to be the enriched media 
So when we are doing the testings, let's do a quick recap. First, you do a gram stain Chinese letter. Next, you do the Albert staining for volutin granules. Next, you start growing it on enriched and selective media. Third, you can do the LX gel precipitation test because you want to find out the toxigenicity or the non-toxigenicity. And finally, nowadays no one does it, but Schick test is also a test done for susceptibility. What is this? Schick test, for those who remember, Schick test is a type of a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. It is done on humans. It is done on humans to find out the susceptibility. Is the human susceptible or is he immune? Basically, you want to find out two things. Is this human being still susceptible to diphtheria? Will he have diphtheria or has he become immune? Is he susceptible or is he immune? That will be determined by the Schick test. So whenever in the exam they say that the Schick test has come out to be positive, what is the interpretation that uh, you would probably take out there? Repeating, when they say in the exam that the positive Schick test is noted. Let's start with the questions. Positive Schick test is noted. It indicates that the person is susceptible to diphtheria that the person is basically susceptible to diphtheria that is what you have okay moving on let's practice other questions starting from this Corine bacterium diphtheria is what I've already done it's a bacilli and I know that all bacilli are gram negative but McDonald bacilli are different gram positive bacillus it is a gram positive bacillus PYQ FMG exam Coming to the next question, diphtheria toxin acts by, now this could, some, this could be something new, I have taught you everything about the diphtheria toxin, did we teach you something about the tox gene being present or absent and how the bacteriophage can transfer it from one place to another, but finally how does it act, what is the mechanism of action, remember it inhibits the protein synthesis. It inhibits the protein synthesis and that is how diphtheria happens. Unfortunately, no mnemonic for this. Something that you'll have to mug up. Diphtheria toxin inhibits protein synthesis. Question number three, FMG PYQ. Which of the following is the most severe form of diphtheria? Which of the following is the most severe form of diphtheria? So, I think everyone knows the respiratory involvement, the larynx involvement. Involvement of the laryngopharynx will definitely be the most severe form. Moving forward, Corine bacterium species causing erythrasma, the first thing that I taught you, Corine bacterium species causing erythrasma. So, do you remember we had something called Corine bacterium minutissimum? Minutissimum causes that red color, coral red color rash that I was teaching you, yes. So, minutissimum for erythrasma. Next one, PYQ, neat PG. Presnocard bacillus. Presnocard bacillus. Which of these is known as that? So, presnocard bacillus, mycobacterium, Corine bacterium ulcerans, pseudotuberculosis, or bacillus serious. And the answer is pseudotuberculosis. Do you remember the mnemonic? P and S. P for the presnocard bacillus, and S was that it causes infection in the sheep. That is what we had studied. It causes infection in the sheep. Let's see if we have more questions. Corine bacterium diphtheria is arranged in what? It is arranged in which alphabet arrangement? Chinese letter or Chinese letter I told you also known as cuneiform arrangement. Chinese letter or cuneiform arrangement is what it is seen in. And tomorrow uh, and in the next sessions, I will be telling you the same uh, question again and again because all these are left. So by the end of bacteriology, we should be able to answer all of these that are there. Moving on to the next question, false about Corine bacterium diphtheria. This is a good one. This is a PYQ again from NEAT PG. False about Corine bacterium diphtheria, also the last question of this session. Deep invasion is not seen. Uh, did you see, was there a membrane forming superficially or was it going inside the larynx, going inside the tonsils? No, you said that ma'am, there was a superficial pseudo membrane that was formed. So it remains superficial only. Deep invasion is not seen. That is correct. It remains superficial. It does not go deep. Next, LX gel precipitation test is done for knowing toxigenicity. Yes, do you remember that filter paper wala? And I told you whether the lines will form or not. Is it done to know the toxigenicity? Correct. 
Metachromatic granules are seen again correct. Did we study volutin granules known as Babe's Ernst granules, known as bipolar granules, known as metachromatic granules? Yes, metachromatic granules are seen. Last one. Toxigenicity is by chromosomal changes. No, does chromosome determine it or is bacteriophage going to actually transfer it? Toxigenicity is by transfer from a bacteriophage means by which genetic technique toxigenicity is dependent on transduction. So, which of the following statements was false over here? Option number D was the answer over here. Well, with that, I think it's been quite an extensive session. We've done a lot of bacteria from staph, entire family of strepto, Neisseria, meningitis, gonorrhea, entire corine bacterium is done. And in the next session, this is exactly what we'll be starting with. We'll be going ahead with the spore forming bacilli. So we've got bacillus species, many of them and a lot of clostridium species also coming up. So yes, that will be what the next session will be along with many other bacteria as well. We'll be wrapping it up in the next session. So yes, that is how it goes. Thank you guys for joining in. I hope you guys are benefiting from the same. I've given you a tiny little homework of reading the revised Jones criteria. I hope you'll be doing that with a thumbs up in the chat box that you've done it. And I'll be meeting you in the next session with many more bacteria and a continuation of the microbiology crash course. Thank you so much and a recap. PDFs are available on the Telegram groups and channel and the link for that is already available in the description below. So please you can download it from there. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Study well. All the very best.